1897, the newspaper Baltimore American held a small but strange entry along with other news such as a boiler explosion, a problem with counterfeit money, and a father reunited with his son. It's a report of an American court ruling that took the testimony of a ghost as evidence. Now, I don't like ghost stories because they often prioritize dramatic scares over authenticity. With that being said, my goal in this video is to build out a foundation that might help us come to some solid metaphysical theories. But back to the news article. It reads, July 3rd. Some time ago, the wife of E.S. Shu was found dead in her home. A coroner's jury rendered a verdict, death by heart disease. Neighbors were not satisfied. The woman's body was exhumed and her neck was found broken. Shu was indicted, convicted, and sentenced to the penitentiary for life. The principal evidence was that of Shu's mother-in-law, who testified that her daughter's spirit had come to her at a seance and said Shu had killed her by breaking her neck. All the other evidence was purely circumstantial. The more complete story goes that Edward was working one morning and sent a boy to check on Zona, his wife, at their house. The boy discovered Zona lying on the floor dead with her hand on her abdomen. As soon as Edward was notified, he ran back to the house in a display of bewilderment and did not leave the side of his deceased wife. Even during the doctor's examination of the body for cause of death, Edward held on to Zona, weeping and cradling her head in his arms. The cause of death was determined to be a complication of pregnancy, but other sources suggest the initial cause to be from a heart condition. Edward went ahead with the burial preparation for the funeral the very next day, dressing the body in a dress with a high collar and even a scarf, saying it was her favorite scarf. It was unusual at the time for a husband to attend to a deceased wife as women would prepare a woman's body for burial. Though unusual, some people cracked it up to Edward's immense grief at losing his recently wed wife. Other locals were more suspicious, including Zona's mother. The newspaper reported that she participated in a seance, while other sources more commonly report that she committed herself to prayer for days at a time in order that she could find answers regarding her suspicions of her son-in-law. The story goes that the spirit of Zona came to her mother at her bedside and revealed that she had indeed been murdered. After disclosing the details, the apparition began to leave, walking away with her back turned towards her mother, when suddenly the ghost reenacted the gruesome scene by snapping her head backwards so that her head was turned towards and faced her mother while the rest of her body was turned as she was walking away, vanishing as she went. Wikipedia explains what happened from there. Armed with the story allegedly told to her by the ghost, Mary Joan Hester visited the local prosecutor, John Alfred Preston, and spent several hours in his office convincing him to reopen the matter of her daughter's death. Whether he believed the story of the ghost is unknown, but he did have enough doubt to dispatch deputies to re-interview several people of interest in the case, including Dr. Knapp. He was likely responding to public sentiment, as numerous locals had begun suggesting that Zona had been murdered. Preston himself went to speak to Dr. Knapp, who stated that he had not made a complete examination of the body. This was viewed as sufficient justification for an autopsy, and an exhumation was ordered and an inquest jury formed. Zona's body was examined on February 22, 1897 in the local one-room schoolhouse. The autopsy lasted three hours and found that Zona's neck had been broken. According to the report published on March 9, 1897, the discovery was made that the neck was broken and the windpipe mashed. On the throat were the marks of fingers indicating that she had been choked. The neck was dislocated between the first and second vertebrae. 
the ligaments were torn and ruptured. The windpipe had been crushed at a point in front of the neck. Shu was arrested and charged with the murder of his wife. And that's where the Wikipedia entry ends. He was ultimately found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison, where he died only a couple years later of an unspecified illness. Many historical accounts of the Greenbrier ghost do not attribute the ghost testimony as directly influencing the sentencing of Edward Shu. Instead, the story highlights how the ghostly revelation to Zona's mother led the prosecutor to reopen the case. The alleged spectral visitation detailed the manner of Zona's death, which remarkably matched the findings of a subsequent autopsy that had not yet been performed at the time of the visitations. While the spectral testimony itself did not directly contribute to Edward's conviction, it was instrumental in uncovering the evidence that led to his sentencing, blurring the lines between the paranormal and legal history. Before we move on to the next account, I wanted to discuss a possible explanation for the ghost of Zona appearing to her mother. In doing so, it's important to ask, what is a ghost even? Is it something outside of and separate from one's internal mental processes? Is it internal and presents as a hallucination? Or is it Einstein's spooky action at a distance, but on a cellular and neurological level? An example of what I mean is when twins separated at birth grow up to have the same occupation, both have a first and second marriage to women who have the same name for each marriage, etc, etc. That's a real life example, by the way. Another would be when one twin, not separated at birth, is shot and killed as an adult, while at the exact same time, the other twin, blocks away, simultaneously collapses to the ground for no apparent reason. Also a true story. Could such a link be shared with a mother and daughter, where the mother, while not witnessing the murder, receives a signal from the daughter at the time of her death. The mother perhaps only experienced the signal as an intuition or an uneasy feeling that something wasn't right. She went into a trance state of mind through deep meditative prayer, tuning into dark corners of the psyche not normally accessible to waking conscious. While in this state, she picked up on the signal and it was decoded and interpreted by means of a vision of Zona. An even simpler explanation is that the mother witnessed the unusual behavior of Edward at the funeral, acting more like a hired mourner rather than a grieving husband, noticing also the sight of Zona being laid to rest with a scarf around her neck. Even if her waking conscious mind didn't pick up on these things, it's possible that her subconscious mind did, and as a result, it persisted to bother Zona's mother by means of impulses and uneasy feelings over the whole matter. The subconscious mind established a working theory of the cause of death, determining that it was a murder. All that need be done now is for her to access this part of the mind through deep prayer and meditation. Once in the trance, the outer world fades and the inner world surfaces, along with the subconscious mind's theory about Zona's death, which plays out like a strange, trippy virtual reality movie clip. And maybe it was neither one of those explanations. You'll see in the next story that neither one of these theories could really work for this particular sighting that follows. Oh, and according to this next story, Zona's murder is not the only court case ruling determined by evidence disclosed by a ghost. The account, year 1652, involves a young woman who was employed as a live-in maid for a certain family. The neighbors around town began to suspect that she was pregnant, and, not wanting to lose face with the community, this guy named Walker, who got her pregnant, devised a plan to send the maid away, where she could be looked after, have the baby in secret, and to come back in due time when she was ready. So, she went away one night, near dark, with this guy named Mark Sharp, a coal miner, who somehow knew Walker. Many months had passed, and little to nothing was said in town about the maid being gone. They probably didn't care, figured she had left to have the baby elsewhere, or had left town for any other reason that people leave towns. But that all changed one night, when a random mill worker saw something. 
James Graham, being a miller and living about two miles from the place where Walker lived, was one night alone very late in the mill grinding corn. And about twelve or one of the clock at night, he came down the stairs from having been putting corn in the hopper, the mill doors being shut. There stood a woman upon the midst of the floor, with her hair about her head, hanging down and all bloody, with five large wounds on her head. He, being much affrighted and amazed, began to bless himself, and at last asked her who she was and what she wanted. To which she said, I am the spirit of such a woman who lived with Walker, and being got with child by him, he promised to send me to a private place, where I should be well looked to, till I was brought to bed and well again, and then I should come again and keep his house. And, accordingly, said the apparition, I was one night sent away with Mark Sharp, who slew me with a pick, such as men dig coals withal, and gave me these five wounds, and after threw my body into a coal pit hard by, and hid the pick under a bank, and his shoes and stockings being bloody, he endeavored to wash them, but seeing the blood would not forth, he hid them there. And the apparition further told the miller that he must be the man to reveal it, or else that she must still appear and haunt him. The miller returned home very sad and heavy, but spoke not one word of what he had seen, but eschewed as much as he could to stay in the mill within night without company, thinking thereby to escape the seeing again of that frightful apparition. But notwithstanding, one night when it began to be dark, the apparition met him again and seemed very fierce and cruel, and threatened him that if he did not reveal the murder she would continually pursue and haunt him. Yet for all this, he still concealed it until before Christmas, when being soon after sunset walking in his garden, she appeared again, and then so threatened him and affrighted him that he promised faithfully to reveal it next morning. In the morning he went to a magistrate and made the whole matter known with all the circumstances, and diligent search being made, the body was found in a coal pit, with five wounds in the head, and the pick and shoes and stockings yet bloody, in every circumstance as the apparition had related unto the miller, whereupon Walker and Mark Sharp were both apprehended, but would confess nothing. At the assizes following, I think it was at Durham, they were arraigned, found guilty, condemned and executed, but I could never hear they confess the fact. There were some that reported the apparition did appear unto the judge, or the foreman of the jury, who was alive in Chester in the street about ten years ago, as I have been credibly informed. But of that I know no certainty. There are many persons yet alive that can remember this strange murder, and the discovery of it. For it was, and sometimes yet is, as much discoursed of in the North Country, as anything that almost hath ever been heard of, and the relation printed, though now not to be gotten. I relate this with the greater confidence, though I may fail in some of the circumstances, because I saw and read the letter that was sent to Sergeant Hutton, who then lived at Goldsburg in Yorkshire, from the judge before whom Walker and Mark Sharp were tried, and by whom they were condemned, and had a copy of it until about the year 1658, when I had it and many other books and papers taken from me. And this I confess to be one of the most convincing stories, being of undoubted verity, that ever I read, heard, or knew of, and carrieth with it the most evident force to make the most incredulous spirit to be satisfied, that there are really, sometimes, such things as apparitions. In future videos, I want to look more deeply into these bizarre occurrences, exploring their psychological and metaphysical implications. It makes me think of Rachel Plummer, who might have had a similar experience in a cave while held in captivity by Native Americans in the mid-1800s. Let me know what you think. Was what she saw psychological, or was she really seeing a Well, I don't want to spoil it for you. Click the video on the screen to watch it now, and I'll see you over there.